It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Hauk, Episode 7, How Going FICOR Affected My Acting Career, with Ricardo Lori. It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Hauk. Turn your passion into income, Ben will show you how. With all the resources that you need to make it as an actor in an expensive city. To stay balanced and make money. Welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. I'm Ben Hauk, and on this podcast, we talk about acting, money, balance, and tons of other topics related to earning an income as an actor. Thank you for tuning in. This is Episode 7, titled, How Going FICOR Affected My Acting Career, with Ricardo Lori. Pull up the show notes right now at actingincome.com slash episode 7. Now, before we dig in, I want to plug today's sponsor, Stand In Central. Have you ever wanted to become a stand-in in TV or film? At Stand In Central, we share what you might expect if you've just been hired as a stand-in on a film or TV show. With its gear reviews, weekly blog, and even its downloadable stand-in handbook, Stand In Central offers a solid foundation in how to be an excellent and effective stand-in. Since 2010, Stand In Central has been the go-to resource for standing in on film and television productions. To prepare yourself for your next stand-in job, check out StandInCentral.com. If you're a union or a non-union actor, you may have heard of something called financial core status, which also goes by the name FICOR. This episode of the Acting Income Podcast covers the topic of FICOR in an interview with an actor who declared financial core status, Ricardo Lori. But before we get to the interview... What does financial core mean? Well, a little disclaimer here. I'm not a lawyer, so please be sure to cross-check anything I say here. The term financial core originated in the 1963 Supreme Court ruling of National Labor Relations Board versus General Motors, and it appeared in this passage, quote, The burdens of membership upon which employment may be conditioned are expressly limited to the payment of initiation fees and monthly dues. It is permissible to condition employment upon membership, but membership, insofar as it has significance to employment rights, may in turn be conditioned only upon payment of fees and dues. The term membership as a condition of employment is whittled down to its financial core, unquote. What does this passage mean? Well, it means, according to the United States Supreme Court, Workers need only to pay initiation fees and monthly dues in order to work in a union shop, nothing more. In other words, to work in a union shop, you do not also have to abide by union rules. You simply need to pay their initiation fees and monthly dues. How this applies to actors in just a second. Now, in the 1988 case, Communication Workers of America versus Beck, It came into question whether a union could take the fees and dues of a financial core member and apply them toward activities by the union that aren't related to collective bargaining. The Supreme Court ruled that, no, the union could only collect monies from financial core workers related to collective bargaining. Any political or ideological activities the union spent money on could not be funded by the fees and dues of financial core workers. In essence, If a union did more than collective bargaining, it could charge its members for those extra activities, but it cannot charge those financial core workers. Put another way, think of the union like an apple. You have the apple core and you have the pulp around the core. When you're a union member, you pay for the core of the apple and you also pay for the pulp of the apple. When you are FICOR, you only pay for the core of the apple. So when you're FICOR, your dues are less than the dues of a full-fledged member. How much less a FICOR worker pays really depends on how much the union claims to spend on activities outside of collective bargaining. So what does this mean to you as an actor? You can be a member of a union, and in so becoming a member, you have to pay initiation fees, periodic dues, and also abide by their rules, else face prosecution. But you can become a financial core member, sometimes called a fee-paying non-member, and in becoming one, you have to pay initiation fees, a little bit less than periodic dues, and you do not have to abide by union rules and face prosecution. In particular, when it comes to SAG-AFTRA actors, you do not have to abide by Global Rule 1 when you declare financial core status, which is basically a pledge union members take that they will not work on a non-union project when there's a SAG-AFTRA collective bargaining agreement in place. And this pledge applies worldwide. 
This means that any sag after member who declares financial core status is able to work in both union and non-union projects anywhere in the world because by the Supreme Court definition of financial core, that worker does not have to abide by union rules like Global Rule 1. The actor only needs to pay initiation fees and lower periodic dues. So, going FICOR is a Supreme Court-backed right to pay a union only money for collective bargaining and nothing more. With that right comes the ability to ignore any union rules, and when it comes to actors, it tends to be synonymous with the ability to work on both union and non-union projects. Just to be clear, the term financial core does not translate to you can work union and non-union. That's not its definition. Working union and non-union is more like a consequence of going financial core. Financial core more specifically means only paying the union for collective bargaining and nothing more. FICOR is a hot topic in acting circles, one filled with more disinformation than information. In truth, it's pretty hard to find a lot of unbiased information about FICOR. So I wanted to cover the topic of FICOR on the Acting Income Podcast with someone who's actually working FICOR. I've worked with my guest Ricardo Lori in the past on union jobs, and only recently did I learn of his FICOR status. I asked if he'd be interested in coming on the podcast to spell out his experience as FICOR in order to dispel some of the rumors about going FICOR, as well as inform those interested in or considering FICOR. I really commend his courage for talking about the topic. I want to especially encourage you to listen to the end of this episode, where I'll provide information on how to hear bonus material from this interview and get additional information on FICOR. Now, a little about today's interviewee, Ricardo Lori. Ricardo Lori was born and raised in Connecticut and is a working actor currently living in New York City. He's studied at the Atlantic Acting School and Stella Adler. After leaving acting for six years to work in corporate America, he realized his passions were still with acting. Ricardo works daily to make his passions a reality in the world of film and television. And full disclosure, I love this guy's voice. Now, my interview with Ricardo Lori. Welcome, Ricardo Lori, to the Acting Income Podcast. Hey, thank you, Ben. It's great to be here. I'm glad you could come on. Now, Ricardo, you come from an interesting perspective. You were a union actor. You were a SAG-AFTRA member, and you have declared financial core status. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, that's correct. So when did you become a union actor, and how did you get into the union? Well, I originally got into the union, like a lot of people, uh, through extra work. They needed me as a stand-in on Nurse Jackie, which you and I uh, both worked on there for a number of years. We did. That paved the way for me to get into the union. And at the time, I really needed it because I was just getting my uh, foot in the door. That was back uh, at around 2009. And uh, once I joined the union, it was great. The pay was great, but there were also some drawbacks. But at the time, I was just happy to be working. And some of those drawbacks came to surface later and ultimately led to my decision to elect financial core status there. In setting up this interview, I explained what financial core status was to the audience. So we don't need to go into detail about what it is. But I wonder what motivated your move to financial core status? Well, I began seeing the landscape changing, the types of projects that were out there, the breakdowns that I was seeing. I noticed that there were more commercials and industrials and so on going non-union. There were a lot of non-union projects uh, springing up, and the pay seemed to be well. By no means were they as uh, lucrative as the union gigs but there was a lot of work out there to be had for the non-union actor. And as a union actor, our avenues have kind of shrunk over the years. There's not as much of a career path as you used to have. If, the, if it were, say, 25 years ago or even 20 years ago, uh, we wouldn't even be having this conversation because there would be a lot of work for us to get. There would be a stint in the soap operas or uh, something of that nature, an industrial. A lot of the industrials in the time years ago, they were all SAG industrials. Uh, now they're all non-union. And you have a lot of commercials for regional banks or even uh, mid-sized companies and even restaurant chains that are non-union. And while these don't have the same perks as a union commercial, they still are able to provide an actor with a great body of work that they can add to their resume. And it also provide an actor that doesn't want to get stuck doing background work. It can provide you with an avenue to have principal work 
because there's just so much out there that's non-union. And I know some people frown at that, but did you get into this to just be an extra and hope that someday you'll get an audition for a union gig? Or do you want to work as much as possible? And, and I would rather you know, be as creative as possible and be able to do as much as I can because I didn't get into this to just be a, a blur in the background. I want to do more. So is it fair to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please explain this in your own words if it explains it better, but did you find that there was a wall that you were coming up against? So you came into the union doing background. You found it hard to get principal work in the union. So you saw principal opportunities outside the union. And is that what you were starting to see? Yes, yes. And, and- And, you know, basically those smaller projects, I mean, they're not all, you know, student films or these uh, rinky-dink nickel and dime operations. Some of these projects are very well run, uh, professionally done. And a lot of times we're sitting in front of the TV. I'm sure a good percentage of those commercials, we're not going to be able to tell which one is union and which one is not. And, you know, I just noticed that there were a lot of commercials out there and a lot of industrials and a lot of small films and everything, and they were non-union. And I also had friends that worked at television stations that did local spots. And one of them approached me about doing a commercial up in Connecticut for uh, Guida's Dairy Milk. And I had a blast doing that. And I didn't want to be in a position where I, you know, if they asked me, Ricardo, we'd love to have you on this commercial. And then I have, is that SAG? You know, I would have to ask that question. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't do it and turn my friend down. I don't want to do that. I, I want to, as an actor and performer, I want to be able to take on a project, uh, you know, of my own decision. I, I don't want somebody getting in the way of that. And I'm not trying to vilify the union for, you know, having that global one rule, but it's very hard for an actor trying to make a living that is at our stage of the game. We're not superstars. I'm not an A-list talent or anything. It's very hard for somebody working their way up to, you know, completely abide by that. So, I, you know, I didn't want to work under the table or work in secrecy. I would prefer that everything be above board. So I, I you know, I went FICOR. So you went FICOR. You declared your financial core status. Now, what did you specifically do in order to become FICOR, to declare that FICOR status? Well, this was interesting. I mean, at the time when I did this, uh, SAG and after in the process of moving around so the phone lines were a disaster, I couldn't get through to anybody. So I wound up calling Los Angeles and I expected there to be this big intervention or the next time I was on set, you know, these these union people come sweep me away, take me into this uh, room, sit me down and have an intervention. None of that happened. You know, I was told that I had to talk to Sally Tish and uh, eventually I would have to mail her a uh, document stating that I wish to elect my financial core status. You do have to turn in your card. And once you send that in, that's pretty much it. You get a confirmation letter saying that you are now financial core and your union dues will be reduced in accordance to the financial core status. And, and, And then that's pretty much it from there. I mean, you can go and do whatever you want and not be looking over your shoulder. Because you're not held by Global Rule 1. Is that is that the case? Right, right. You're not held by it anymore. But if you are booked as SAG, AFTRA, you are then entitled to the same benefits and treatment on that set as your, the rest of your union counterparts. So it's not like, you know, you can be treated bad or made to sit in a different section or you can't have, you know, the crafty or whatever. You know, there's a lot of the, all of this hysteria and misnomers and stuff like that. When you cl- declare your financial core status, if I'm not mistaken, you are no longer a sag after member. You are a sag after non-member, a, a fee-paying non-member. Is that correct? Correct. I am still paying my dues. And those wondering if you're going to save a ton of money, don't don't get excited. Your dues get reduced by about five or ten bucks. Uh, You keep your number, whatever number was on your union card, that is still the same number. So you have a number, you're not a member, you're a non-member, but you still have a number. Yes, it's a little confusing and convoluted the way that works. But yes, you're still a member. When I am working on a SAG project and the union rep comes by, I'm treated like a SAG member because that's just part of the contract. I mean, I have to be treated the same. If I'm working on a non-union project, I mean, you're on your own, of course. That's obvious. Everybody knows that. 
But uh, the resistance that I got from the union when I asked to switch over, it was that there wasn't any. To switch over from union to to FICOR, yeah. Uh, yeah, no resistance whatsoever. Uh, and so, you know, I, I that kind of tipped me off that the, the stigma to all this might not be as bad as some people make it out to be. I hear you. Now, how do you market yourself now as FICOR? When it comes to casting websites on which you submit yourself, you... I mean, you could check off that you're SAG-AFTRA or you're non-union. How do you do this or how do you do this on your resume? Is there any, any guidance you might be able to give for other people? Well, yes. I mean, the first thing is a lot of these casting websites, they are going to have an option, a little box to check off that says sag fi Core, sag after fi Core. So you can check that off and you're going to be fine. As far as listing your name on the resume, I just have my name and my, and my, um, my manager's info. And they pretty much take care of it from there. I would say the breakdown of my auditions is probably 40% or uh, 40, yeah, I would say 40% union, 60% non-union. Uh, say that again, the, the breakdown of what? Like when, when I audition, I, I would say, uh, when I'm sent out by, you know, on auditions, I would say that the breakdown between all of the auditions I get through the year would be probably about 40% are union auditions, 60% non-union auditions. And that is just because of the sheer number of non-union projects going on. I hear you. As opposed to having 100% union auditions, but having being a very small amount, you have, it sounds like more than doubled your audition, uh, the amount of auditions you're open to by going yes, FICOR. Exactly correct. I mean, the the auditions that I have been on just this year alone um, we're in, let's see, we're in May, you know, we're only a few months into the year. I would say I've had over 20 auditions, some of them union, some of them non-union. The non-union auditions have been for commercials, for regional banks. Uh, they have been for chain restaurants. They've been for universities, colleges. They have been for stores, that you know cover multi-state areas but are not nationwide. All of them paid decent amounts of money. They were not anything like the SAG after a commercials, but you have to in terms of pay? In terms, in of, terms pay? of pay, I mean they were a few thousand dollars. I mean these commercials the are non-union. Right. Non-union ones are going to pay you. There's just not going to be the residuals and everything like that. Still even saying that, you are still exposed to a bunch of casting directors that are not only just casting for non-union, they're also casting for union. And the vibe that I get from those guys is, you know, they don't really have time to worry about your union status. This is something that, you know, at union meetings and other actors that are very into the union, I mean, they banter about about it. But when I, I found that when I'm out auditioning, nobody is really questioning my union status. I think the only time it's been questioned was, I think it's happened about two times. Interesting. So, I mean, you've covered a lot of stuff of what you've gained from FICOR. Uh, it seems like you've gained more auditions from your experience, not to say that everyone's experience is going to be the same. Um, it seems like you gained perhaps more exposure to casting directors and maybe an expedience in them working with you. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it sounded like that you said you make it less of a trouble for them to work with you. Well, I mean, I have had the opportunity to get thrown around all over the place, much to my, you know, much of my own personal gain here, because I've just been able to, to go through all of these different casting agencies. You know, one time I'll go and it's a non-union gig. The next time I go, it's a union gig. And I, I'm just basically increasing my chances. I'm coming to the table with more cards, uh, for lack of a better term. And and this is really the reason for me why it, it seemed like a good thing. I, I, I think that if you're somebody that's hardcore union and you, you need to go to those meetings and, and you feel that it's very important to vote, and you feel that you want to have an active voice within the union and participate in all of those things that they do, then FICOR definitely isn't for you because, you know, that, that's one thing is uh, it's not for everybody, but for some people, it's the right decision. In claiming FICOR status, you actually did lose some things, too. Can you speak to a few of those things that you lost when you went FICOR? 
Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the first thing is you lose your card. Now, there's a very psychological bond that builds up with this union card. I didn't realize this at the time. But sending that card away did feel kind of weird at first. But after I sent it away and I started auditioning and I started getting some work here and there, uh, you know, I, I, I got over that. Uh, I, I think we're all so proud of getting that card at the beginning when we make it and we pay the the initiation fee and we, you know, we get all of our waivers, all that kind of stuff. That was one thing. You do have to turn in your card. The other thing is you can't vote. I mean, I, I lost out on voting. Uh, so to some people, that's important and that's fine. I wouldn't tell anybody they're wrong for feeling the right to vote is important. Some other things, you're not going to get the screeners. The SAG Award screeners, you mean? The SAG Award screeners, you're not going to get those. You're probably not going to be admitted to the uh, functions that they have within the SAG after headquarters, the workshops, and so on. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to use some features on the website like iActor or things like that. You're able to log into the website, is that correct? I can log into the website, but it's really weird. Uh, it's, it's like they kind of restricted me from paying online, which is something new. And I found that a little odd. I, it's just like, you want me to pay my dues, but you're going to make it difficult for me to pay my dues. Did you think that was expressly for you? Because there was a, the, it was down recently when I went to pay my dues, but I, it was a certain point at which it was back up. Do you have to know that? Well, that that's a good question, too. The, the, the last time I went to pay my dues, the, you know, it was just like, you are ineligible to use this feature. So I called and I was just like, listen, do you want my payment for the dues or not? Oh, sure, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, they took it right over the phone. That's... So, and, uh, I... just to be clear, when you go FICOR, do you lose access to health insurance? Do you lose access to pension? No, absolutely not. In fact, the access to your health care and pension is something that is there is a federal law that protects you from losing that. You're absolutely not going to lose that. There are a lot of rampant rumors around that if you go FICOR, you somehow lose this. This cannot be taken away from you. Perks, going to seminars or workshops, yes, those can be taken away. Pension and healthcare, absolutely not. Uh, all that work you're doing that's union will all go and be counted towards your health and pension. Any non-union work will not be, uh, for obvious reasons. But you're never going to lose that. And that was the most important thing for me. As long as I could keep that, I was fine with my decision. I should say that there are also other things that you lose when you claim FICOR status. And this is not an exhaustive list. Those are some of the big things that you notice you lost. So each person's situation may be a little bit different than yours. Sure. You explained your relationships with casting directors and how they changed or didn't when you claim FICOR. And I think you touched a little on agents. What about with fellow actors and crew members? And, and I even spoke to you about union reps. How did those relationships change when you went FICOR? You've hinted a little bit. I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe an example or two. Well, yeah, that's a great question. I've kind of adapted, which will all change after this interview, of course, the don't ask, don't tell policy, because I just found that there are too many people in regards to this issue where it's very polarizing and it's this black and white issue with no nuance or thought about the more subtle points to all of this. It's, e it's either one extreme or the other, and you've got the two sides battling it out with each other. And I don't really side with either of those because I don't have an issue with the politics of the union per se. You know, I am a liberal and I didn't do this because, you know, I'm, I'm you know, politically opposed to something that the union is doing. I certainly am not going to also hate somebody for making a decision to enhance their livelihood and to keep working. So, you know, I kind of stay out of the way with other actors, but when it does come up, I'm careful about who I, I talk to about it. And a lot of times it's really surprise at first and then a lot of curiosity. They want to know more because what I find is that person talking to me knows somebody else that's FICOR 
but is keeping it secret because of the stigma attached to it. And they tell me that their friend is working all the time and they couldn't be happier. And they just want to know if I have the same stories, you know, if I'm happy with it too. And by and large, I am happy. I, I'm, I'm satisfied with uh, the decision I made and I'm, I'm happy with the way things are moving along. I don't feel that you know, I've really hurt myself in any way. As far as the union reps on set, I really haven't come out and declared it to them, but they they do come up. They they know me. They see me plenty of times. The relationship seems still cordial. I think they're great guys and, and gals. I think they, they do a great job. Uh, I've got nothing against them. And, you know, it's great to see them on the set. It's great to see them on the set and catch up. Here's a specific question in terms of crew members. Let's say when you're doing background work and you're given a prop, usually you exchange your union card for that prop. So how does that change if you don't have a union card? I just give the driver's license now. Ah, good. <laughs> so, yeah, they give me, they give me a, a, a cardboard cup, you know, a cardboard coffee cup and I... There I am forking over my license. So we have a few more questions I'd like to ask you. I guess somewhat quickly, I think you've already talked about some of the misnomers, but are there any misnomers about FICOR that you wanted to spell? For example, is it selfish to go FICOR? Is it anti-union to go FICOR? Can you speak to any of that or any of those questions? Sure, I'd be happy to. I don't, you know, you could be selfish and in the union and you could be selfish out of the union. There, There's selfishness everywhere. Uh, there, There is selfishness uh, running rampant in this business. I don't believe that the problems the union is facing right now is because of FICOR. I believe people that do go FICOR are a symptom of a bigger problem and it is that the contracts that were negotiated, while they seem great uh, at first glance, may have hurt them long term, which is why we have seen things shifting and a lot more non-union work, well-produced non-union work, all of a sudden available. So when an actor is trying to make ends meet and trying to put food on the table, I don't think it's selfish to consider this and to think long and hard about it. I don't believe it's the answer for every actor. I do believe for certain actors uh, it is. And if that actor makes that decision to go FICOR because they want to be able to audition for more projects or to express themselves creatively in a project that is non-union, I don't see how that's selfish. Uh, You are an artist and then you're a union member. You did not get into this business to serve the union. You, you, you can't, I mean, the union helps us. The union protects us on various projects. But if the union gets in the way of you expressing your creativity, I feel that there's a problem with that. And I don't feel that it's anyone else's business to tell another actor, hey, you can't do that. You're selfish. Because what is that actor to do? That actor is to sit on their hands and, you know, not perform in their friend's play or uh, a short film or something that may be non-union. And I know people bring up, well, you know, there's the SAG ultra low budget and everything, but, you know, it's not in every production company's best interest to go through with all of that because based on what I've heard from them, the process is too onerous. So that might be something that the union should look into. Some of these production, they don't have time. Their client, I mean, I did two major projects for Pepsi, non-union, Pepsi. Pepsi is doing this this project. They're electing to do it non-union. There's got to be a reason for it. The production company can dig in and say, well, no, this has to be a SAG project. Well, guess what? There goes Pepsi. And, you know, you can argue that this could be a race to the bottom and driving wages down. But I I don't really agree with that because I still see an audition for a lot of these commercials and they're paying a decent price. And I am not going to say that you know, I'm not in a position, basically, let me put it this way, that if somebody says, yes, I've got a non-union commercial for you, it's eight thousand dollars. We want to book you for it. I am not in a position, and I think a lot of actors listening to this, are you really in a position to walk away from $8,000 on the table? Conversely, 
if you are a great actor and you're worried that an agent or somebody is going to discriminate against you because you're FICOR, take a step back and breathe for a second. Because let's say you invite that agent to a showcase. You blow that agent away. The agent is sitting there saying, wow, he's got this theater riveted. He's got this whole crowd in the palm of his hands. This guy can be Oscar material. I've got at least five projects I could probably, oh no, wait a minute, he's FICOR. No, I'm gonna let him go. Does that make sense <laughs> to, the, to the agent who can, you know, it's, it's, the whole thing is crazy and you have to, these are the, the finer points you really have to examine and you have to see, is this right for you? Is, and, it, is going FICOR anti-union? No, I don't really think it is anti-union. Uh, not with the current atmosphere the way it is. Is it similar to if someone said you're being selfish by going FICOR? Is it similar if someone said that you're anti-union going FICOR? That you could be anti-union and in the union and you can be pro-union but outside of it as a non-member, a fee-paying non-member? Well, the, the, the thing that these people have to remember is, is that it's my legal right, as well as every other actor that elected FICOR status. It is the legal right. It's not like we went ahead and did something that was underhanded and shady. I don't believe the small percentage of actors that are out there doing FICOR work are bringing this union down to its knees or what the spin, whatever spin they're putting on it. If that were the case, this union would have folded a long time ago. I mean, both unions have merged. Was it because of FICOR? I don't think so. There's a lot of bigger problems out there. And these are the kind of problems that they, they've got to tackle. And if the atmosphere was different, if if, if all of the, the projects out there were union and the only thing out there that was non-union were like really, really bad projects, just just awful stuff that's like a, a hair above student film. Well, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't consider it. What do you have to say to a member who was interested, a uh, sag after member who was interested in FICOR or someone looking to become a non-member of a union? What would you say? I, I, the first thing I, I would tell them is to Figure out what is important to you, because that is all, that is a question only you can answer. The union cannot answer that for you. Your acting peers cannot answer that for you. You have to make the decision yourself. The answers are with you. If you are on one of the boards, if you are politically active in the union, it behooves you to stay within the union. And I would never suggest going by court to somebody where that is really important to them. Because I understand, you know, the activism and being a part of all of that. Some people really get a lot out of that and they really are, uh, it, it's a passion for them and I'm not gonna tell them to, to forfeit that. If you are somebody that you enjoy the benefits of the union, but you're not married to, you know, just being union 24 seven and you have very specific ideas of what you want to do as an artist, of what you want to do creatively. And some of that may stray outside of the union lines. If that is the case, FICOR may be for you. Because at that point, nobody can really get in your way and say you can't do that. Because none of us got into this business by listening to people say, you can't do that. We all grew up around people saying, you need to be a doctor, you need to get a job at the bank, you need... Everybody said, you can't be an actor. There's no money in it. There's no way to do it. Well, there is. But you've got to do some things that require a lot of thought, some sacrifices, a lot of hand-wringing, uh, you know, a lot of restless, sleepless nights. But in the end, it all works out. So last question for you, Ricardo. What do you think would have to happen to motivate you to rejoin the union? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, th uh, there could be an angry mob that surrounds my place of residence, <laughs> watches, uh, because, uh, you know, th there are these angry actors that are kind of like the SAG police. Uh, and, and I do love them. I know some of them and stuff like that. And we debate on it. This is not, you know, t t this is all in, in jest. But seriously, uh, to consider rejoining at this point, I, th I think there would have to be there would have to be some changes. I mean, I would have to see a lot more work, commercial wise, industrial wise, the smaller projects. I'd, I'd have to see a lot more of those coming to the forefront, which I don't see. 
Uh, I also uh, would like to see s some more. Uh, gosh, how can I put this here? I, I, I would like to see them listen to their voters more. And I'm not saying any of that out of hate for SAG-AFTRA. I, 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 I can't stress this enough. I don't hate SAG-AFTRA. I just think that their restrictions and rules uh, for actors at certain points of their career are a little too are a little too much, and they're really the the union is really catered towards the the A listers and stuff like that that can afford to say no. But for uh, you, it was a it was it has felt like a right choice to claim your financial core status. Yes, to claim the financial core status. I mean, if 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 SAG AFTRA had more uh, things in place, if they had more. I would say uh, workshops or uh, mentoring programs to get you out there. And I know they do have them, but it's not all encompassing. If they had kind of what your regular union had, your regular union would have like a union hiring hall or something like that, which is very hard to do. It's the world of show business. But I, if they did more to get their actors working, I would really consider jumping back. What I think now is this is such a competitive business. The numbers of union actors are so high, the job's so little, they can't really do that. There are definitely things where if they did it, I would consider. And there is a process for those of you wondering that go FICOR, there is a process if you really do want to go back. There is a process in place for you to go back. It involves a hearing they're probably going to slap you with another uh, initiation fee, but it is there. Uh, they do reserve the right to not let you back in, but that's something that will would have to be decided at the hearing. For the most part, many actors, including myself, we're not really considering going back. We're, we're kind of happy where we are, and uh, if we do want to go back, we'll cross the bridge when we come to it. Ricardo Lori, thank you so much for being brave to share your financial course status story. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. As I said before, I have some information on how to get bonus material from this interview and how to get additional information on financial core. If you visit actingincome.com slash FICOR mail, you can subscribe to my autoresponder series on financial course status, which includes an MP3 of Ricardo Lori sharing two experiences he had with casting directors who questioned his FICOR status and how he dealt with it. I think you'll find them quite entertaining. You'll also get more complete lists of what you gain and what you lose when you go FICOR, so you can weigh your own choices when it comes to union membership. Whether you're a member of SAG-AFTRA or Actors' Equity Association, I think you'll find the autoresponder series very enlightening. Again, visit actingincome.com slash FICOR mail to sign up, and if you missed that link... It's also in the show notes. Thanks again to Ricardo Lori for sharing his experiences, and thank you for listening. That's the show. This episode was sponsored by the website Stand In Central. To learn about standing in and to download the Stand In Handbook, visit standincentral.com. The show notes for this episode are available at actingincome.com slash episode 7, where you can leave a comment on this episode. You can also find Acting Income on Twitter and Facebook. Rate and review this podcast on iTunes by visiting actingincome.com slash iTunes. If you'd like to sponsor an episode, check out actingincome.com slash advertise. I'm Ben Hauk. Donovan, which is thank you in Bengali. See you on the next episode. For more information, as always, check out actingincome.com.